I wear a few different hats. One is VM Center for Peace, where I do all my peace work. Then I'm a chair for action for UN and Euro. Under that, we try to have the United Nations. Uh, all the United Nations lack all the reforms it, it needs. We highlight that, and we all we want is a basically a effective, transparent, accountable United Nations, which can look after the world in peacekeeping and other areas, and then completion of uh, land development goals, looking after environment, human rights, etc. Under World Disarmament Campaign, <coughs> we highlight the disarmament issues, which are the nuclear weapons and small conventional weapons. And we had a very successful meeting last week in the House of Parliament in London, in which we had very distinguished speakers, uh, Lord Henry Chiswick, who was our former ambassador to the United Nations, Lord Peter Archer of Sandwell, who was the uh, Attorney General under Callaghan and Wilson government, and Rebecca Johnson, who does a lot of work on in Economium Institute. And uh, because what's happening with nuclear weapons is, it's a very important year, this year and next year, for coming run up to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 2010 in New York, which I'll be attending with, and along with my wife Shanti, she's here actually to introduce her in the big sorry Shanti. <laughs> and uh, uh, and there's because of the universal effect that Obama and uh, all the people's people are having the right notes for positive thing, uh, so we think there is. A opportunity, change. opportunity, and time for change, as Thomas says. Can I just ask on a, on, a, on a question point to you or to others? Because um, obviously, Southern Ireland is a non-nuclear state, sure. has has a commitment to non-nuclear. The UK is a heavily armed nuclear power. Does sure. do, do UK nuclear weapons ever come to Northern Ireland? Do nuclear submarines ever dock in Belfast? Does anyone know? Yes, I do. You think? They do. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, you know, and I know that the issue of nuclear power in the North Sea it's, it's used to be a problem. I mean, wind scale pumping oh. nuclear radioactivity into the North Sea was caused. Cool. So it is, it is something on the It is, it is. What, yeah. but what, what they're trying to do is replace the nuclear submarine, tried it with cost of 76 billion, which I, or most of us people, will think here, we could spend more wisely yeah. instead of spending on our. But um, in the absence of a peace policy, we can't even begin to have that debate. You know, it's, it's, it's in terms of polarization, you know, the, the anti-nuclear lobby and the pro. I mean, there's no actual thinking there. No, so, no, no. It's all, all a paradox. On one side, they're saying, oh, we should need a uh, reduction of uh, nuclear weapons. And on the other side, they're still on the... Because it's an election coming, election coming in the UK next year. Mm. That's the last year. Gordon Brown can be Prime Minister, he has to call the election yeah. in May, June next year. So he has to play a twin role because the Conservatives or the new neocons, what we call them, mm. they, they are in favor of keeping the, uh, the nuclear deterrent. And so, in other words, spend your money. But then in the well, that, 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 that question of the role of British politics in relation to the Irish is interesting. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, well, we can go into all that. When okay, we yeah. Into okay. Well, no, I can come back if you want. Yeah, some, yeah. Because I haven't spoken anything about the TRC with you. No, no, no. We, 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 you've prepared a paper. Yes. Three yes, yes. of you. Yes. So, uh, full confirmation. Yes. <laughs> yes, I have. Okay. Yes. Right. And I'd like to, like to speak about okay. that. No, you'll, you'll, you'll get a chance. Okay, um, Pat. Hello, everyone. My name is Pat Sheehan. I'm a former political prisoner. I spent uh, two periods in prison, total over 18 years. I was on the blanket protest for nearly four years and was on the 1981 hunger strike uh, for 55 days. In fact, I was the longest on it at the time the decision was taken to end it. I'm here representing Koshja and Air Kimi. It's uh, a group uh, representing uh, Republican ex prisoners. And our role is to provide support uh, for former Republican prisoners and their families. We also campaign to end discrimination against uh, uh, political ex-prisoners.
terms of employment, provision of goods and services, uh, and um, we also are involved in dialogue with a wide range of groups uh, in civil society, trade unions, uh, members of the Protestant churches, victims groups, and former loyalist paramilitaries. Right, greetings, Pat. Nice to have you. And hopefully you can go into more detail later on. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Catherine Mann. I'm currently working on North Denver Council as the Good Relations Officer there, and engaging with um, mainly in terms of bonfire management. And, um, Say that again, so you which match? Bonfire management. Oh. Yes, it provides an emblem. Can you just explain what bonfire management? Um, there isn't any. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Is this is? Um, Eleventh night bonfires. Um, so, so bonfires are lit all over your region. I think all over the north of Ireland, but it's particularly. On the which date? The eleventh night, eleventh of July. Eleventh of July. July. 11th of July. 11th of July. Right. And then your your job is to make sure they don't get out of hand. No, no. My job is to address the contentious issues that surround the actual uh, existence and need. Okay. It's a Protestant tradition. Yeah. So. Okay. That will be very interesting. Hopefully you can tell us more about that later. Explain what it is that you do. Yeah. Well. Um, my name is Louise Reddick and um, I was a teacher for many years in Nationalist West Belfast. And I was involved in the very beginnings of EMU, which was Education for Mutual Understanding, where the government tried to bring together children from both sides, which was really a, you know, a, a tick box exercise. Um, it just made absolutely no difference, really. And then whenever I come out of teaching, um, I, have not, I now I work in um, a small business, which works, for, uh, works with non-profit making organisations. And one of our main areas at the minute is that we work with loyalist groups. Um, we did a large project in one of the uh, UVF controlled estates uh, about five or six years ago, um, working with, with them to try and bring them into kind of normality, really. There was a lot of young men in the area who were um, involved in drugs and um, Anti-social behaviour. So we worked with one of the UVF leaders to try, first of all, develop the capacity of the estate to control itself. Um, and then from that, um, I've also been involved in in nationalist areas as well, trying to help instead of you know top down trying to get the groups to find their own solutions and um, helping them to develop a strategic plan to try and actually achieve something. So um, I've been recently involved with um, loyalist women who um, were quite bigoted and didn't want to move on and um, would have had the attitude that if a Catholic was working in the local chemist they wouldn't actually go into the chemist, uh, they would boycott the chemist. So um, what we did was try to work with them to build up their own confidence in their own culture and um, to feel secure, and then we moved them on to link them with a group in West Belfast of nationalist women um, who would be much more secure in their, you know, in their understanding of their beliefs. Um, so that's the kind of work that I'm involved in at the minute. Um, I've been recently working with an ex-UDA uh, leader um, who would have been part of the Jolly Adair um, era and um, he is he's talking the talk about racism and wanting to you know uh, develop his group of young men to accept um, but at the minute I think he's talking the talk I don't think he's going to walk the walk so I think there's a lot of people in Northern Ireland who um, have learned how to play the game and uh, know where the money or the funding can come from but I think on the ground there needs to be an awful lot of work done about what real work means and um, how to change that mindset. <coughs> In Northern Ireland at the minute, they're among both nationalist and uh, loyalist groups, there's this feeling of they're taking our jobs. 
you know, they're doing things that we wouldn't do and, the, you know, the, this whole, it's really building up now. I can feel it on the ground starting to really get dangerous. When you say they're taking their jobs, what, what? Uh, ethnic minority groups coming into Northern Ireland. Okay, so that's, that is an issue. A ma it's going to be a massive issue because I was working with a lot of women who would have had jobs in the hospitals here mm -hmm. and um, you know the, there would be a, a lot of Filipino nurses coming in to, to those jobs and there's a, a feeling that they will do things that they shouldn't be doing and go the extra mile mm -hmm. to earn their money. So there's this terrible resentment building up at the minute. Among, in both communities, Lawless and More so I would say in the Lawless communities. Um, I've heard it in the Nationalist community as well. Now the Loyalists would actually see the Nationalist community as being more welcoming of um, ethnic minorities um, and would, would see them as being more open. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I think I think this could be the next right. the next okay. so step. It's, well, it's an issue that's on the isn't it? And, and definitely yeah. yeah. And you said you were doing some of the umbrella of small business. What? What is it called again? Um, it's called Stakeholder Development and um, we don't just work in the area of, um, we would do work with say parents of children with autism um, and that type of work. We do a lot of work around uh, suicide and mental health as well. So it's just at the moment. Well, it sounds like you're very busy um, and then more, more than one of you have played. Yeah, at the minute I'm focusing more on the um, I suppose loyalist communities at the minute, that's just what I happen to be involved in. Okay. Great, appreciate it. Welcome. Yeah. So, Welcome, Morgan, and pastor of City Church in Belfast, um, involved in the Young Church and um, University area of the city, and um, moved the church that opened our doors to the remainders recently and got all the headlines. So, mm -hmm. that's our background. Been in Belfast 18 months. Uh, before that, we were in South Africa in Johannesburg, working in local churches there. Our churches are age-wise relatively young, and very also young families. Quite a few of our folks actually work uh, behind the scenes in peace and reconciliation, uh, bringing different sides together, and doing a lot of the work in, in that. Um, and we support the work of groups like Embrace Northern Ireland, which work with asylum seekers and refugees over here as well. So, so you can hopefully later tell us to all that. We can, yeah, we can tell you the wrong story, yes. Well, can, what's the background of the church like, in denomination terms? The church is um, relatively new, it started 25 years ago. Um, just to break away from the traditional churches, the uh, more charismatic side of the church that developed in Britain about 40 years ago. Right, so it's some of the evangelical type. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, excellent. But it's not it's non denominational without Protestant Catholics or yeah. together, that's not an issue. It's, it's under the spirit, that's what yeah. That's right. Okay, right, thank you, Mark. Um, Hi, I'm right. Trish Morgan, I'm Madam's wife, um, and um, I'm here today purely because I wanted to listen more to the um, truth and reconciliation thrust of things. Obviously, living in South Africa for three and a half years before we came here in Johannesburg where they are still, I think, facing some major issues and that whole area of, um, of um, communities facing one another and first of all telling the truth, which I think is an important part to peace and reconciliation, um, is, is having a profound effect in that nation and obviously we've now come here. So we seem to go to cities and nations of conflict but at the same time um, uh, find ourselves into all sorts of different things. So we're very interested to be here today. Thank you for inviting us. Um, and hopefully through dialogue and conversation with various people we'll get a greater understanding of what's going on. And my personal interest is from a, a media point of view, because that's where my background has been. Um, and I remember seeing a, a programme, I don't know if anybody watched a documentary, The Day After Peace. Did anybody see it about a year ago on television? It's a dear guy who wants to create a day for peace and his go by the United Nations and all the political will in the world to try and create one day. Um, and it's a fascinating documentary and it just said, like you mentioned earlier, we don't seem to have um, a strategy or um, a policy or how we do peace. We know how to do what, but we don't really know how to make it happen on the other side. And that whole thing has got us thinking quite deeply. So. And the role of the media is it is going to be crucial. Mm. And um, I mean, there was also a very good documentary um, 
program in Britain recently on a, a dialogue with, with Liam Neeson, one of the actors. Yeah. I don't know if that was shown here or not. That was quite powerful about potential truth and reconciliation. Mm. Yeah. I won't, I won't be here, I don't think, this afternoon, because some of the things that might be discussed, I think the media had quite an interesting part to play in our recent conflict in terms of the Romanians and thereafter the stoning of our church. Um, and, you know, it is an Your interesting... Church yeah, it was a week later. Um, and it was an interesting um, situation we found ourselves in where basically the questions we were being asked on camera, live, um, were very difficult to sidestep um, walking into something that before you knew it could be taken as a soundbite and pushed back out. And you know that I found I find language a very interesting situation coming that we've lived in online before, but coming back after 15 years, yes, we have noticed a rise in immigration in, in the immigrant population. But secondly, how important language is in this nation. Sure. Um, what to say, what what you don't say. Before you know it, you can be saying something you feel I didn't really mean that. And how I think the media has a part to play in that, in what they portray, and before the questions you're asked sometimes will put you on the spot in such a way you're thinking, I don't even want to answer that question because I don't have the knowledge. Or secondly, I know it's very wise to say something on that point. We could really start on an almighty, you know, sure. big thing here. So, so the question is in the, in the way the media is set up and run, and the way that and yeah, well, it, you know, our church was saying it had nothing to do with what happened the week before. And we said at the very beginning, it's a bit too early to count this, but before I knew it, we'd been asked on TV, radio, what do you think about the people that have done this in response to this? And I said, well, actually, I don't think the two are connected, but it was very hard to get that message across. You okay, know, well, so, well, yeah. That's, that's very important. We'll come back to that. And hopefully, you can both share a testimony that mentioned that's very important. Um, can I just introduce our, the Institute's media coordinator, um, Nicola, who, who's um, a silent presence at the meeting, but very important, <laughs> and has, um, runs, um, helps run a thing called Holistic Channel, which, which has shown some of the work I did in the Middle East. Um, we went together to Jerusalem in Palestine last year, and she filmed patiently um, many of these discussions. And, um, you know, I think, I think just a quiet, um, <coughs> Media presence is, is important. So and then, yeah. Is this yeah. Because I don't say yeah. It. Well, that, that's the, um, the, the the thinking behind it is that we will film the, the, the meeting as it happens. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody feels that they're giving or sharing something that they're uncomfortable about being shared, um, then please let's talk at the, at the end of the meeting. Well, that's um, that's you know if if there are bits you want to be edited out, absolutely. then we can I do that. Yeah. No, 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 absolutely. I mean, no. Nicola is the editor as well and, and knows. I don't know how to do it. I mean, I can't do my job, but somebody's going to repeat what sure. I say, you know, because I'm in a situation that's. Um, mm -hmm. You know, confidential, so yeah. absolutely can't have repeated something like, you know, he talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the walk. Is that what this guy? Right. You know? <laughs> okay, well, um, let's, let's, let's for the moment say that this will be a private record, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and what we might do is then make a very kind of benign, sort of edited version, taking out anything that's contentious yeah. for the public. But the actual, you know, record stays, stays as a private thing. Um, under Chatham House rules, should we say. Okay. Um, but, um, okay, so thanks for that. Um, Carol, do you introduce yourself? Yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Carol Cain. I work for the WEA, the Workers' Education Association, and we run uh, adult education classes in the community. Um, we primarily target people who are outside of the normal education environment and try to bring them in. We also um, do some work-based learning and also prepare people for work to get them into employment as well as uh, upskill them when they're in their, their jobs, whatever. Um, and we have quite a wide curriculum as well. Um, we've gone through quite a few changes in the last, certainly in the last year um, and in the last few years running up to that as well in that we've moved, uh, we would have been funded to have run non-accredited courses in the past but we've had to move into accreditation and qualifications. 
um, and last year Dell uh, local government department uh, stopped being our core funder, which was quite a blow to the organisation. Um, but we work on projects now, and we've already with quite a few tenders in for peace money, and we've already got word that we've got some of that money to come in as well. Um, my background is creative. I would be mainly involved with creative industries or creative learning courses, but a wider curriculum than that too. Um, and as an artist, before I started working with the WA, I was involved with um, various pieces of peace and reconciliation work, but one in particular in the aftermath of the Oma bomb, which we've been working with people who were uh, locals in the town at the time of the bomb, as well as close to the families who were bereaved. So that was quite a project, a lot bigger in its conclusion than I had anticipated at the start. And it was an art based project? It was, yeah. yeah. Sort of art therapy working with victims and so on? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, um, I'm going to more detail later on yeah. if you want me to, yeah. But, um, but yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I have noticed Belfast seems teeming with art activity. That's something I've noticed. I've not been here for eight years. There seems a lot more going on in the creative industries. In Belfast, maybe across the whole as a whole, which is a good thing, I think. Mm. Right, greetings. Um, do you want to confess your presence here? I'm a bit so, yeah, this has, got <laughs> come, this has got to be welcome. My name is Dan Keenan, and I'm Northern News Editor from the Irish Times. And I have been sent here uh, by my news desk in Dublin with a view to writing a report on this for Monday. Okay, so, so I'm very glad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So on the basis of what I've just heard in the last two minutes, you can see the difficulty. <laughs> now, um, that said, um, so I, I am here, strictly speaking, I am here wearing my reporter's hat, sent by a person who took one look at the invitation to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission type meeting here. Assumed it was going to be like an Ames Bradley type ding dong, where there was going to be insults and probably more. Flying, I thought that will provide some light to copy for Monday morning. Off you go. Um, I don't think that the person who phoned me yesterday to send me here had this in mind whatsoever. Um, so, strictly speaking, that's why I'm here. Um, on the other hand, I can't, I never have been very good at totally di divorcing Dan King, the reporter from Dan King, the citizen, the person who lives and works in this community. Uh, and I'm hugely interested in, in personally, in, in, in your introduction because I've studied some of the things you've, you've mentioned about and I'm personally interested in them. And if people here trust me sufficiently, I would be more than happy to, to throw in my thoughts for what they're worth. But it can be very difficult to be here in a professional capacity and in a private one, both at the same time. Because strictly speaking, you shouldn't be taking part in something that you're being a, a disinterested observer. So that may be too much for people, and, uh, and if they prefer that I didn't do that, or if I wasn't even here, I perfectly understand that. Perfectly understand that. No, I think, I think but the last thing I want to do is imperil what, what, what has got off to a good start. Yeah, no, I think it's, you're very welcome to be here. Mm -hmm. Under both hats, we all wear multiple hats in life. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll, you'll be sufficient professionals to sort of have that view, mm -hmm. and, and then bear in mind people's sensibilities. Well, absolutely. Uh, this is just, this is what I was going to say, and maybe this is the best way I can sort of um, uh, set out my stall, because I, I'm very aware of what was said by Louise, was it, across the room here? Uh, and the last thing I want to do is, 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 is put people in a difficult situation. Um, it's not the first time this issue has arisen. Um, myself and my, my colleague with the Irish Times here in Belfast were always, not always, but we have frequently come to a situation where you are you don't have an agenda, but at the same time, you don't want to be doing anything through your work that would imperil other people's good work. Oh. Uh, and therefore, all sorts of issues arise, like self-censorship and what do you say. Oh. <laughs> you know, uh, you're always aware of the effect that a report may have, were it to be published, oh. and would it imperil other people's much more valuable and, and wide-ranging work. Well, hopefully, I mean, what I'd like to think is that at the end of the meeting today, we'll have some good news. Well, I, I, if, for, if, for sure. if people are prepared to accept my, my bona fide in this, I'm well skilled in writing a report that reads like a report but doesn't impair anybody in, on an individual basis. Okay. Now, you only have my word to take for that, well, I'm afraid. That's but all we all have for each other. I know that, yeah. Because the trouble we're is, different people because we're just pretending to be the same. Yeah, but the trouble is that uh, if I write something, there'll be 120,000 copies of it on Monday morning, and it'll be on the internet and it gets 25 million hits a month. 
So I could wreak a little bit more damage than maybe somebody else here could. So, but all I can say is, oh, absolutely. You have to take trust. Yes. Well, I'm afraid so. And if people, as I say, that's gone. Can, to, can I just ask just, yeah. just a bit about your background before you? Got yeah. The How long have you been with the law? Were you with the Irish Times or in journalism in general? Well, just 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 tell us. Well, I've been I've been with the Irish Times uh, since 1993. Um, I previously. Uh, worked. I was assistant news editor with the Irish News, the back of which is just over there. That's how I knew where Frederick Street was. Um, I've also done some freelance work with the newsletter, which used to be just down the road here in Glenmore Street, uh, with the Guardian, with the Daily Telegraph, and I've done little, very, very little odds and sods um, with some of the broadcasters. But primarily, I'm a press journalist rather than a broadcaster. And if you add all that up, I've been in this. Bit of a rat race for that since 1983. <coughs> right, so during the, the kind of last phase of that? Yes, very much so. Um, and on both sides of the, of, of the press fence, I've, I've, the bulk of my experience is on the editing side, which is basically office based and collating reports, producing pages, sending reporters out, all that sort of carry on. And then in 2001, um, I had a fantastic midlife crisis and I went back to reporting. And I'm still in the midlife crisis. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can just, just, I mean, maybe you can tell us this later, but yeah. I'd be very interested in the role of the press in during the time of trouble. Yeah. Did, did the papers divide on the sectarian lines? Did you have your nationalist paper and your lawyers' paper and so on? Uh, yes, to, it, to, it, the crude but simple answer is yes. Um, and, and the position of the Irish Times in that, so Dublin based. Yes, very much so, yes. So that, that would be like trying to be like the Times of London. Uh, yes, but like the Irish Times, uh, we, we, we've always joked, uh, doesn't see itself as a as a as a as a company; it sees itself as an embassy. What well, uh, here in Well, just globally, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so it, 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 you know, it it it, do, it does take a position because that's what that's that's what newspapers do. Um, sometimes they could try and. Now this, <laughs> just, I'd put my cards in the table as well, which, which I wouldn't want repeated. Um, it would also put itself in a position where it is seen to be above the conflict rather than part of the conflict. So that, I said that by way of criticism of my own employer. But by and large, I think it's by and large, I think its role in terms of offering a platform and offering uh, informed opinion has been more positive than negative. But I. I that, that comment, that criticism is based on the view that I take personally that you cannot be in Ireland, North or South and regard yourself as apart from the conflict. A lot of people do that because it makes them feel better, saying, I'm not the problem, it's those guys up there. You know? sure. And the Irish Times does that from time to time. Well, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar very much with the Irish press, but when I've read it, it does seem to have a more intellectual approach to yes. analysing the problems. Yes, very much so. And, and more interest in ideas and you know, other kinds of papers just report the surface stuff. Yes. So in that sense, it's appropriate maybe that you are here, because well, the point of the TRC is to go into the... the I, well, I leave the question of appropriateness to somebody else here, because, you know, because anyway. of that. But, but it, yes, I, th I think that is fair, and it, it has done more than others, especially in recent years when Northern Ireland has seemed to be such, quote-unquote, a switch-off subject, that uh, while, the, while the newsrooms in London, uh, or the news organ organisations in London, have closed the Belfast offices, and the double, other Dublin papers have closed the Belfast offices, we're still here. Right. Um, and we're still here writing on a subject that is deemed by a great number of people to be very, very unsexy indeed. And that they'd rather deal with it by ignoring it, and we don't let them do that. <laughs> well, that's, that's, Long that's, that's continue. We may come back to that when we talk about the media role in this. Yeah. Okay, um, sure. Hey, my name is Sean English, and I'm based in Dublin, and I was there. And I, all the years I've been teaching a peace studies course at the Free University of Ireland. Uh, I've worked with Thomas on and off over the last couple of years. So it, when he, the idea of setting up the truth and reconciliation commission, uh, I know what, it, it, what I'd like to just hear something about today is I know there has been an attempt, so I think it's the Eames Madley debate over the last few years about whether there should be a truth, uh, you know, a major government sponsored commission in Northern Ireland. I'm not sure where that has gone to. It seems that I haven't heard very much about it recently. Um, I'd just like to see what people's feelings are about that maybe later in the day, whether that should be pushed on a much bigger scale. And I know like from experiences of other post-conflict societies in South Africa, 
it works or it doesn't work depending on where your viewpoint is, uh, and whether it should work for, or whether it couldn't work in North America or in North and South America. Well, there's various sort of parallel initiatives that have been yeah. taken in the last couple of years. And we, we, I can show you, we've contacted them all. We've done quite a lot of research as a background to this meeting. We've, we've, we've contacted the various bodies, which I've got a list of. Um, sort of reparations type, type groups. Yes. Um, and a truth commission, um, you know, proposals and so on. I mean, I'm hoping that, that something will crystallise. I mean, our work is very much just catalytic. Um, one of the problems was, was the issue of funding reparations that, that one of the initiatives, I think, went into the sand over. So if we wait for the politicians to set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we might as well come back next century, I suspect. But I think it was the very issue that that because sometimes the truth can cause more um, conflict. You know, when you start bringing the truth out, they don't want to be, you know, another context, whole context of situations. I don't know if post conflict is the right uh, term or not, but that, um, whether bringing out the truth is, is, the, is the right way. Peace of the 21st century. Sean is also a philosopher, and this book, The Collapse of the War System, goes into um, some of the great thinkers around peace issues in, in the 20th century. So, um, you know, that's, that's a part of the background. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, Michael Cleese is my name from the. British Irish Secretariat in Belfast. I work for the Irish side. Um, my background is in the Department of Justice in Dublin. I'm only in Belfast since last January, which explains why I was late here today. I couldn't find this red book for <laughs> quite a while. Um, just topically, I spent five years fairly recently in Dublin when I was in the Department of Justice working in the Immigration Division at the time when the explosion from the Celtic Tiger happened, hmm. and I, I just purely from an administrative point of view, I mean it was very difficult to cope with because we weren't ready for it, you know. Um, so that's, I mean, I think immigration problems are, are universal, uh, they're not simply problems associated with Northern Ireland, you know. Hmm. Um, that's all really. Of, oh, the, other, the only other thing is, at weekends, I cover the weekends here for the Department, both the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Department of Justice. I'm a kind of a one-horse wonder, and the result that I, I, I attend various events or whatever has to be done. So I won't be able to stay all day, but I'll certainly stay to lunch and anyway. Right. So you're, you're from the British Irish Secretariat? That's right, yeah. Which is the... the um, is that the thing that they're going to put in our map, the building and building? No, Armagh is a different branch. That the British Irish Secretariat looks after the remnants of the relationships that exist between Britain and Ireland, which there's a devolution process going, ongoing at the moment where powers are being devolved to the Northern Ireland's administration. So between Britain and Ireland, you mean between Great Britain and Northern Ireland? It, some of the powers, that certain residual powers exist, uh, uh, continue to be vested in the British government here, policing and justice being one. Right. And as those powers are devolved, the theory is that the secretary of where we work should eventually sort of disappear and that um, the north-south bodies which exist as we speak and there's a, a separate secretary in Armagh that looks after those. The main sort of stuff that I deal with are policing and justice issues. Uh, that's to be the main topical interest and also generally the situation related to parading um, I we would maintain uh, an interest in that and try and have contacts with both sides of the community and that's sort of thing. Right, right. Um, okay. um, so I'm just trying to understand the, the background. Your actual employers, your paycheck comes from the the Northern Irish government? No, 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 oh sorry, no. The Southern um, Irish yeah, this if you like, this, this body, which was set up uh, under the British Irish Agreement, is staffed by foreign affairs official, officials from the Republic and Northern, uh, 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 Northern Ireland Office officials from Britain. And they work side by side in the same building. So the, the, the southern side, if you like, is staffed mainly by Department of Foreign Affairs officials. 
but we have two Department of Justice officials working in there with him. Right. And, and I'm one of those two Department of Justice officials. As a result of the cutbacks and the, the economic difficulties down south, the, the number of people serving here at weekends has been cut drastically. So I now attend, if you like, events oh, which wouldn't, yeah. foreign office type things that I wouldn't traditionally right, right. have dealt with. Okay. Well, that explains it. Thank you. I was mm -hmm. just trying to map it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Michael, what about Um, Mama. Uh, I'm Phyllis Brain. Um, well, I was an MSc student doing Sustainability Rural Development part-time course, but I did a bit of a hiccup with the Queens. But um, anyway, I'm initially from, I'm living in Kerry but I'm initially from Tyrone, as you probably recognise by my accent, but I'm initially from outside between Coal Island and Gannon. I was conditioned with all the troubles at the time. The troubles, I had a brother left home and um, eventually died indirectly, I'll say, indirectly because of the troubles. And then went on got married and married a civil servant <laughs> and, um, who fell into severe stress, mental illness because of the troubles. And we said her divorce, but uh, I'm just saying I'm conditioned to it from that point of view. Um, also, as most people know, I'm visually impaired. And um, I'm into different charities um, and I'm a child of special needs. So a combination of all that I've done um, throughout my life, I'm very interested in what we're doing today and moving forward. Because when there is disabilities and disabled families, uh, the troubles also have an extra bearing on that. And they come quite often we have to bury that. And uh, now that things are begin people are beginning to open up and uh, is dealing with those consequences now. Mm -hmm. so right. Thank you. And so you're originally from near Duncan? Near Duncan. Yeah. I'm in Belfast now over 30 years with those issues. I, you know, I just live with all those issues of how it's been searched and all that drama. And it just has all that memories in your mind. And, mm -hmm. um, and I attend, you know, visiting prisons and things like that. So it's just. Um, you denied all that part of yourself and got on with life. And it's just when things are settled down and I work with all our families with disabilities and that, that uh, I'm a member of cause obviously because of my husband's mental illness. I meet all our families and the children with special needs. Um, all families, um, you know, similar to myself and then now that they're beginning to release that, uh, why and how and how they can move forward. Okay, that's very interesting. Well, hopefully we can hear from you later. That's great. Okay. Oh. Hey, sorry for being late. Apologies for that. Um, Jacqueline Monaghan this morning. And I work with the um, CAJ, which is the Committee on the Administration of Justice, which is a human rights organisation uh, here in Belfast, which has been around since 1981. And uh, we primarily work in different areas, um, equality, protection of rights, which is primarily um, social, economic and cultural rights, uh, including kind of pushing for the Bill of Rights for the past 10 years, and um, policing, and then I would be the Criminal Justice Programme Officer. We would be quite active um, in issues, say, from the political aspect of dealing with the past, and would be quite involved um, with the kind of aims for other proposals and uh, recently just had a seminar sponsored by ourselves, the Transitional Justice Institute, which is part of the University of Ulster, the School of Law at Queen's um, and British Irish Rights Watch, which is a, an NGO based in London, which kind of unpacked certain issues um, in the proposal in the Ames Bradley report about the Legacy Commission and, and other aspects. And that conference, um, well, it was different from what it was intended to be initially, but what it turned out to be was a two-day conference unpacking certain issues um, and had a number of governmental officials, both from, from the South and from the NIO, the Northern Ireland office, and academics and Number of victims groups and you know people different different people or different 
sectors mm. interested in, in different aspects of dealing with the past. Um, and then for on a you know, more personal level, I worked with the Truth Commission in Guatemala 10 years ago as an analyst um, and working with testimonies, and which led me to doing my doctorate. And my doctorate was in law, but looking at the relationship of truth and reconciliation, and really the kind of first was looking at really if I've often, I, I suppose I've, I've, I've kind of come to have difficulty, particularly not because of, I certainly don't blame the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but since then there's been this association which I don't really think is completely founded on actual evidence that truth leads to reconciliation. While I think both are extremely important issues, um, I don't really think we do justice to survivors and victims by pushing this idea that truth will lead to reconciliation. I think truth is extremely important and extremely valuable. But it isn't the end all be all. Like it doesn't lead to reconciliation hmm. in, in my this is, this view. This is Sean's question. Yeah, so, that, so I, I, yeah. I would just have trouble with that. Um, so I did my doctorate and while it was in law, I mean it was quite sociological as well. I mean, it wasn't just pure law. I mean there's a lot of it that is law looking at how law impacts and legislation impacts on law, on, on truth and reconciliation and whatnot. But, so it was just boring. Did you so, look at the Guatemala as the I case used Guatemala study. as my case study, yeah. And you didn't look at other ones like South Africa? So. Well, only in so much that, you know, I've, I've researched and I've, I've um, I, um, I did, yes, and I looked at other conflict situations which haven't used any type of transitional justice mechanism and whatnot. But the case study was 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 gone on, so that I would know more of than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But was in other countries as well, and, and worked and lived in other countries as well of conflict. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Well, I'm sure we'll hopefully we'll hear later, go into more detail. Um, okay. Well, look. I think what we'll do, um, if if thank you for sharing the introductions. Um, We'll break briefly for a, for a coffee, um, and I'll um, work out some running order which, which we can work on. I know some people might have to go before others and so on. Um, I think there's, there's some important issues on the table. Um, so let's, let's have a, a, a pause, okay? Um,